All right, well, welcome to Grog Talk. I'm James. I'm Dan. And who are you? Scourge of the North. Scourge of the North is here with us. <laughs> an, an invasion. It's, it is an invasion. He's, uh, they, they came down from the mighty north. And where are we today, Dan? Well, so our, the fictional place we're from is the Come Back Inn, of course, from Blackmore. But actually, we are from Dave Arneson's Blackmore Studio at Full Sail University. Awesome. So quick background of why, what, what's the importance of Full Sail in here? Sure. So uh, Full Sail Make is sure you where... check this out. So Dave Arneson, one of the co-founders of D&D, uh, taught here at Full Sail uh, in, in the latter years of his life. And uh, in 2010, Full Sail, after his passing, dedicated this studio to his honor uh, and named it Dave Arneson's Blackmore Studio. And so we thought we'd uh, take from here. We're in Winter Park, Florida, right? So our neck of the woods. Right. And so we 15 thought, minutes from Orlando. Exactly. Uh, and home of Grog Con, of course. That's right. And so 2020. We, 2020. <laughs> so coming up. <laughs> the, the clock is the countdown clock is on. Oh, great. And so are you started? Yeah. Have you started on your adventures, Vic? Oh. For Grog well, Con 2020? I don't know which one I'm running yet. <laughs> okay. I guess that's, well, that's a, a maybe. And so, and Vic Dorso here, Scourge from the North, uh, hails from Minneapolis, uh, the home of Dave Arneson. Yeah. And so we thought we would do the Minneapolis Orlando connection. This is their uh, annual invasion. They come down here uh, to wreak havoc and bring the, uh, the North down to us. And mm -hmm. so we're actually playing a game this afternoon at our local game store, which by the way, thanks to Vic, we, we got some wonderful shirts from up North. So Vic, can you uh, kind of give the background uh, on these? This is uh, the Source Comic and Games in Roseville, Minnesota, the premier um, game store. And Dave Arnson actually played uh, Dungeons and Dragons here. And, and so, yes. so wonderful. So we Thank want to shout out to them, and maybe when we uh, go up to uh, see it, see you all in Minis uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, we can you can take us there. So, oh. what's the chat looking like? Production Goblin's here also, which yep. we appreciate. He's still on uh, winter break. And the uh, uh, Emperor Strangler. The Emperor, Emperor Strangler's Strangler is in the house. Emperor Strangler's off the side. She's behind us. That's right. Late. If this doesn't go well, she she's just going to come around here and yeah. actually, you, could, you know, what you can do if you don't like what we're saying, you can use your, yeah. you can use your prop and just uh, throw. Yeah, why do you have rope with you? That's <laughs> not yeah. good. Yeah, just show show us the rope, Jeannie. Oh, wow. See, see so <laughs> it, we are ready. If if, if it, actually, we'll do a poll later. If it's not going well, yeah. just production guys tell us which person. I assume you don't want your father murdered. So which of the other two <laughs> is the strangler going you to murder? Should start with the production goblin. He's at the bottom. Isn't he should he? hang himself. That's, that's very morbid. Yeah. So and we and we should mention too, right? Because we've got uh, we're in front of a display case here, yep. a Dave Arneson display case, uh, which has here uh, the white box and the four OD and D books yep. signed by Dave Arneson, uh, which is very cool. It's super cool. Yep, and it's got a poly a large uh, soft polyhedral die also signed signed, signed by Dave Arneson and some ships because he was big into naval combat. I know yep. you own a copy of uh, his rules, yep. right? Yep. I don't give up the ship. If don't I don't give up the ship, yep. And a lot of photos of Dave Arneson and a copy of, I assume this is not the actual one used. Right. That would be pretty amazing. But of the, uh, the model castle that was used for Blackmore when he ran his Blackmore campaign. So. So we'll take some right. pictures and post them on Twitter when we're, when we're done here. So. Uh, so we, we actually have a special guest coming on, and because we're remote, we definitely want to get this going before batteries and we get kicked out, because we're technically here by ourselves. We've kind of infiltrated here somewhat. Right. That, that display case behind us is looking awfully good. Yeah. We, we are literally, <laughs> no one is within us. Our plan security. has worked. Right. I've already checked it. There's no, there's no alarm. That's right. Yes. That's right. And, and he's a fourth level thief. That's right. Did you bring so him these picks and tools? We've literally um, snuck in here. Yes, I yes. did. <laughs> our, our, our trick has worked yeah, beautifully. Co cover the thing for a second. Yes. Yes. We... Audio difficulties or technical <laughs> difficulties. <laughs> Be right back. It's just a loop. Yeah, it's just right. like the... it's, a, it's, it's a trap. So a trap. anyway, uh, we're uh, we're here, and what our special guest uh, is going to be who? Uh, Dan. It is going to be Dave Wesley who was a member of the uh, Blackmore Bunch, right? And right. Uh, Dave Arneson's original Blackmore group. Uh, and so uh, uh, some have credited him, Dave Arneson, I think, mm. credited him with actually coming up with the idea of role-playing games. Well, wonderful. Let's try to give him a call. So this is super exciting. We're remote. We're making phone calls. What could possibly go wrong right? in this live thing? Let, well, let's see. Let's any see technical if, difficulties? Let's That's see right. if he remembers who we are. That's right. 
If he doesn't, I'd be shocked. Do I call him Mr. Wesley? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'd be shocking. Who is it? <laughs> Hello? Hi, is this Dave? Hi, this is Dan O'Gorman. I've got uh, James here with me. Hi, and, good morning. And Vic Dorso, who I think you know. Yes. And so uh, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to be on the uh, Grog Talk podcast. You're live. Okay. Well, I just got my uh, phone set to speaker mode here, so maybe this can all work smoothly. Um, <laughs> Hold on, I have a, all I have here is a cell phone I hold up to my ear, uh, but so the, the audio may not be the good, and of course the video is non-existent as I have no camera attached to my computer. <laughs> no. These days I'm probably have to kind of figure out how to do Skype, but um, thus far I don't think my computer would support it anyhow. That's okay. Uh, no, no, no worries. Uh, things going smoothly is not what uh, our podcast is known right. for. So, no worries. Technical train wrecks is all about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay. Well, um, so uh, just to let you know, to remind you, we are taping from Dave Arneson's Blackmore Studio in uh, Full Sail University, and so we thought what we would do is we would dedicate this podcast to uh, talking about Dave Arneson. And so obviously no surprise that we would invite you on because of course uh, we know about your history uh, with Dave Arneson. And so we were hoping that you could tell us a little bit about, uh, and, uh, and I know you've, you've done this for Secrets of Blackmore already, which is was an amazing video. So shout out to the Secrets of Blackmore yep. uh, documentary. Uh, but uh, you know, we'd love to hear you talk about uh, your, you know, how you met uh, Dave Arneson and what your initial experiences were. And of course we wanna hear about uh, uh, Bronstein. Uh, if I get rolling, I may just take up your whole hour or six. Um, so let me let me say, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you things in response. Ah, oh, there's actually a picture of me on the wall behind you. There, I see. That solves that problem. Um, I had uh, looked through my computer trying to find pictures of myself that I could send to you. So at least it is still of me around someplace. But you've got a picture of me playing on at the Arneson Studio, so it doesn't matter. Um, all right. So how did they do it? Well, I got started in wargaming in 1958 when I came across a copy of Gettysburg uh, at a local bookstore. I'd gone in there to buy a copy of, I think, Tarzan and the Ant-Man. Um, and uh, it wasn't on the shelf, it should have been on yet. So down below it was a copy of Gettysburg Battle on Hill. So I said, well, what's this cool looking game with a cannon on the cover? So I bought that. And then I was immediately confronted by the problem of any war gamer in the 1950s, which is, where in the world can you find somebody else to play against? Um, I've returned a few friends into playing it with me over the years. And eventually, um, when I got into college, uh, I had a circle of about three people that I was playing games with. But there was a phenomenon from that period, which was uh, the Opponents Wanted column and the General Magazine, which was, of course, the magazine published by Avalon Hill. Um, and in it, for no cost to you, you could get like three lines of text saying where you live, where your phone number was, and that you were looking for opponents, and which Avalon Hill games you love to play. Um, so I was reading it, and I came across a mention from a kid named Arneson who was, who was looking for opponents. And um, I thought, well, this is great. So I called him, and uh, he said, oh, oh, it'd be great to meet you. Sure, come on down. So then the following Saturday, I went down, drove down to the address, and um, walked up the steps to the little red house, and um, knocked the ring the doorbell, and uh, David's mother appeared at the door and said, a little, a little surprised, I think, to see somebody who was a college-age person standing in the door asking for her high school-age son. But she said, oh, David and his friends are down in the basement. Go on down. So I went down, and I discovered that there was Dave Runnerson and I think three other guys uh, who were all high school students with him. Um, blustered around the table with uh, some Avalon Hill game spread on it. And so there was a certain amount of um, awestruck on his part because after a while I was a college man who had my own sports car and he was just a high school kid, but it worked out well. Uh, and by one stroke, I had effectively had double the number of war gamers that I knew in the Twin Cities then. And our group was um, very eagerly uh, looking for more people, as was the standard for any war gamer in that period. Um, and so we were, we were, you know, hunting around trying to find other people. 
and one by one, other guys showed up that joined us. Started in my case, guys who showed up were college age, and in Arneson's case, guys who were somewhat younger. Uh, and that was um, that was being the Military Simulation Association, the MMSA, um, and uh, we had officially gotten started before Arneson came along. We got started in September of 1963 or maybe October of 63, but in any case, uh, before winter set in. Um, and we expanded over the years, and it got to be a pretty good-sized group. Um, it became fairly obvious early on that Arneson was a very smart kid, and um, so he took a very active part in the gaming and so on. And there were some of the older guys, guys older than me, I should say, who didn't really much like that. Um, I have to say in retrospect that uh, they were more justified in not wanting to have uh, artists and the rest of those dumb kids around than I expected, than I thought at the time. I thought they were just being snooty. But um, it was, of course, a, a legal problem in that you had to be 21 to drink in Minnesota. Oh, okay. And um, while, the, uh, while the guys whose house we were mostly meeting at was two years older than I was, and therefore, oh, he, he was two years older than I was, he was married and he had a little girl, um, and we were meeting in his basement all the time, which was nice. Um, he had a concern about alcoholic beverage consumption. He wanted to do it, but as long as the kids were there, he could see himself getting into massive trouble with uh, some authority somewhere along the line for contributing to the delinquency of minors. And so, he really wanted to like, shed all these kids out of the group. Now, at the time he was coming up with these pronouncements, um, let me see now, my, my time's right, yes. So the point he's coming up with these pronouncements, I was still a little short of 21 myself, but he was he was willing to, you know, bend that one a bit because I was, uh, I was a college student exposed to alcohol and everything already. Um, but he wasn't really telling me things like, gee, I'm afraid we'll get in trouble too. We have, we have wine here. Um, and uh, when we're playing our games, um, and if somebody's parents are going to find out, I'm going to be in trouble. He never said that to me. He just said, oh, these dumb kids are going to hang around here. So there was a split in the group, and at that point, um, his very high-handed approach to chasing up all the kids bothered me a lot, so I decided I was going to go hang out with Arnis and, and, the, and the kids instead of hang out with, uh, with uh, the older guy whose house we've been at. Um, and we got along fine with that. I mean, I got along fine with that, and Arneson was very happy to have some of the old guys uh, stay with him, and he became a, uh, a major focal point for gaming in the uh, Twin Cities area then. Uh, so shall we, shall we get on to other things? That covers how I met him and uh, right. how he rose to prominence. Well, yeah, Dave, I'd like to know who came up with the idea of running the campaign games together, because my understanding is you were running Napoleonic miniature war games. And at some point in time, Dave Arneson, if I, if I have my facts right, starts stringing the battles together in more of a, a campaign feel. And, and it, is that correct? And if so, whose idea was it to do that first? All right, well, we, you get into the campaign business, sort of lose our way into it without a conscious plan. Um, it was quite normal in those days. The 50s and 60s era war gaming was, was uh, miniature war gaming was, was pretty, pretty crude. I mean, it had been going on since 1913 when H.G. Wells came up with Little Wars. Um, and H.G. Wells, in, in Little Wars, H.G. Wells conjures up this idea that you will have, uh, in addition to this figure sitting out, on the, sitting out on the floor, in his case, with uh, the terrain you set up around your, around your room and you're fighting your battles with them, instead of just a one-off battle, you're, you're here, there's no reason why you're here except that you're going to have a battle. Um, he suggested that you could have a map showing the countryside with towns connected by roads, and you fight your way across that map uh, with um, you know, arrows and circles and things um, uh, drawn on it, and you have an overarching campaign of which your battle is a part. Um, and this gives a certain amount of rational, um, uh, what can I say, uh, background to why you're having this battle. It also gives you um, reasons why your battles don't always just consist of 100 guys on each side. Uh, you have uh, you have the driving features of the campaign. 
Um, he postulated that back in 1913. And those of us who have been able to find a copy of Little Wars, which was way out of print by those in those days, um, but he, we'd heard of it somewhere along the line, and so he dug around, he found it in the library or wherever. Um, so we were exposed to that notion outside of ourselves. However, we were at that time doing the Molianic era battles using a set of rules that we'd gotten um, by somebody, I think it was David Candler, who was the author of it. Um, and we were having just one-off things with what forces showed up, depending on what troops everybody had painted up. And so it would be uh, Mike Norman's Austrians versus uh, my French versus uh, uh, Greg Scott's British uh, brother and Anderson's Russians. Uh, everybody was happily painting up figures uh, as needed uh, to, uh, to play the battles with them. They were getting bigger and bigger. It was then worked out that it would be nice to try to do this campaign kind of thing. And at that point, campaign was um, drawn from military history where if you have a specific campaign, like the Peninsula Campaign in the Civil War, the Peninsula Campaign in the Atlantic, of course, um, and people would try to nom and to, to model that in the simplest way by just listing all the battles that were fought in that campaign, and then they would set the first battle and they'd fight it, and then set the second battle and fight it without any reference to uh, how, how things turned out in the first battle in the real world influenced what was going to happen in the second battle, and that influence what was going to happen in the third battle. But in the typical campaign of the era, you weren't keeping track of that. You were just fighting like a world series. It's the best four out of seven. Uh, you'd fight these seven battles, say, and uh, the team that took the, took, the, took the majority of them would be the winners for the campaign. Then, however, we got more complicated, and Arneson began to ride herd on all the details and um, give us positions as European heads of state in this first Napoleonic campaign. Um, and we would um, organize our navies and our armies. Uh, we, he worked out, he'd always research in the library to come up with what does a 74 gun ship of the line cost and um, how many men do you need to man it and how many guns does it carry? Uh, or, for that matter, what does a regiment of cavalry cost to raise and maintain? Of course, it's a lot, uh, and so on. So it was uh, it was quite a quite a pile of work on his part, and he wasn't alone in it. All of us, once you got hooked on the idea of doing this higher level campaigning business, um, were madly researching whatever would give us an advantage in the campaign um, and uh, historical details for him. So he was ably assisted by somebody whose name you people probably never heard, Randy Hoffa, who um, uh, went on to found CNC uh, Military Miniatures Company, and they formed a 285 scale uh, micro armor. Um, but he was uh, an, eager, an eager student of about the same age as Arneson, and the two of them were pouring through the libraries at the U of M.C. Minnesota, or the, uh, the St. Paul or Minneapolis Library, finding books, finding references, and doing some massive sort of research to to, put, to keep this campaign going. Um, it was enormous work, and the kind of thing you could probably only do if you either independently wealthy, which none of us were, or, or a college student, and you could you could uh, you know have your own time to yourself aside from what it did to your grades. So he was he was doing this legwork on maintaining this campaign for everybody. Just huge amount of stuff, and he became more and more a central figure in the Twin Cities gaming area. You, the, when, we, when, we, when we hit our peak, we had about 40 people in our war games group, um, and uh, at least half of them were uh, in connected with Arneson, or centered around Arneson. He was the biggest uh, single focal point for gaming in the cities after the group started fragmenting. Um, so he became very important with that. Now, you want to ask me another question, or let me just keep rambling? <laughs> well, well, I, I'd love to hear about Bronstein then. And so, when when does Bronstein fit into this? It was was this all happening before your Bronstein game, or, or was this after your Bronstein game? That was that was started before the Bronstein game. Uh, in fact, we could even say that that it started before Arneson, because I'm thinking back on this now. Daniel Nicholson was one of the earliest guys to come into town who came to the University of Minnesota to go to graduate school to them. And he came from having been an undergrad at uh, Bozeman State in, in Montana. 
Um, he arrived in town looking for a war gamer to play with. Uh, because he'd had one roommate who played war games with him back at Bozeman, and he was dying to find somebody else. So he gets to the University of Minnesota, he goes into their card catalog, and he wants to see the 30 books on war gaming, and indeed, they did have some. So he proceeded to check those books out and had a brilliant idea. Um, in those days, when you got a library book out of the library, it had a, uh, a little envelope, uh, uh, that's not right, a little pocket in the back of the book, um, with a three by five card stuck in the pocket. And then the card had, was all gritted off and whoever was checking the book out would sign for it. The librarian would stamp the due date on the card and stick it in their card file to keep track of who had that book out. And then of course start contacting you about, we want our book back if you didn't get it back at an appropriate time. But when, they, when the book came back in, they took the card that they'd used once and they stuffed it in the back of the book again. So as a result, the card would have the last couple dozen people who had checked that book out would have their names on it. <laughs> and Nicholson realized there's not a, I can find war gamers. Um, so he looked at a book that he'd gotten and uh, there were four people on there and checked it out in the last five years. And he assumed that if you checked it in the last five years, you might still be in town. So he then called off, I found all of us in the phone book and called us. And sure enough, Dan and, um, and three other guys, um, then actually Dan and two other guys, then came into the, our group because our said, I checked that book out and, and Dan found my name. Um, now, Dan in Montana had been running a war game, a campaign game of the early critic, uh, uh, early and uh, fairly simple type. He had a Montana highway map, and you got to be in uh, the ruler of one of the counties of Montana, and the amount of budget that you had was based on the population of the county. Um, and so the principal counties of Montana were handed out, and then you would, you would campaign your way across from campaign. You would fight your way across, uh, conquer your way across, I guess, Montana, Sounds to hard. get at the other uh, major counties. And that was the that was the first time I saw work in campaign and operation. That was before ours and they even joined the group. But that campaign was a lot of talk and never actually came to pass because the burdens of working out all the research on I want to go down this highway, what's the what's the what's the terrain like in this place? I mean it's a highway map. All it shows is where the roads are, not where the hills are. So so we were um we were learning how to go about doing a campaign game by having this unsuccessful and could never really get it running right um, uh, Montana, yeah, World War II technology Montana campaign. But, so that's where, that's where we really got into campaigning. And then that idea was around and it had failed and Arneson picked it up again with uh, more experience later. Now, who else would I, should, I, should I cite in all this? I'm sorry, I think I got off your question. Can That's okay. Your question again? Hold on, I'm going to lower the volume here. Just a second, Dave, We're just because I wanted to distort a little bit, so try it now. Okay, uh, well, we'd love to hear about, so the Bronstein won, the very first game you ran for, for Bronstein. Okay. You, 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 felt okay. It was a, you felt it was a, fail, a failure, and if I recall correctly, that was also the famous incident uh, with Dave Arneson dueling with uh, Jim Clark, is that right? Yes, yes, quite so good for you. Um, all right, well, in 67, I graduated from Hamlin University, and I got a fellowship to go in physics at the University of Kansas. So in the, uh, about September of 67, I moved out, I moved out of the Twin Cities and down to Lawrence, Kansas, and um, while I was real busy with uh, graduate school in physics for the first six months, I really did miss my friends. And so in 68, then, um, I got, I, I'd taken, to, for the summer of 68, I, I got home for a while, of course, between sessions, right? And then I was going to be coming back again you know, around Christmas of 68 uh, for just, you know, a week or two weeks between, between semesters. Um, and I was, at that point, we had gotten into this Napoleonic war gaming uh, based on um, Oscar Higos, The American Game of War, by Charles A.D. Lewis Totten, which had been written in 1880 as a training manual for the U.S. Army to run war games. Um, 
uh, so a, a professional work ethic before. Um, it was enormous, 340 pages of this thing. Uh, when we found it, it was, the, it was the book, which I and three other guys had checked out of the Ugham Library causing Dan Nicholson to find us all. Um, all of us who'd read it said, this is gigantic. The biggest ever one will give you Galilee is like 16 pages of rules, and he's got 340 pages of rules. How could anybody ever manage all this detail? Um, and uh, we had kind of looked at it, been awestruck, and put it aside. But by the uh, 1965 time frame, 66, um, we are having a problem with our, with our games that we were running in that the rules we had, this set by, uh, by Chandler, um, uh, War Games du Temps Napoleon, um, were full of holes. And people were trying to drive trucks through those holes all the time. So we have a battle get started, and then something would come up which needed to be, well, Something would come up, and some of the would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Best, we, didn't we agree that the way we would handle this would be such and such? Oh, no, I don't think so. No, we didn't say that. And then he turned into an argument for the rest of the evening. We'd never get the battles finished. We hit some critical point, and the, the two parties involved would fight with each other all evening long and never get done. And at the time, I did not realize, well, I sort of realized it, that basically some people had had come to the conclusion that as long as I argue all night, I can't possibly lose. Um, and other ones just love to argue. Um, and so they, they, for most of us, in a, a battle with 12 of us standing around the table was with miniatures out there, and nothing's going on except two guys shouting at each other across the table, and it was not satisfying. I, at that point, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. In Totten's rules, the Skirtigos rules, um, you have a referee who resolves all these kinds of things. And if he can just say, okay, you've got five minutes, tell me why you should get to make this charge across this swamp with your cavalry. And then, okay, you've got five minutes, tell me why that shouldn't be possible. All right, you're right, he's wrong, carry on. <laughs> and you could get the game going, keep it moving. Um, in fact, just the threat that the referee could step in would, would avoid formal complications of sort of actually having everybody sit down and argue it. And the games got to moving a lot more smoothly with that approach. Um, so I took the massive rules for doing war games in best of accuracy technology in 1880, <coughs> which were derived from the American Civil War statistics. <coughs> and I said, okay, well, let's we've got the Napoleonic war games, so I'm going to I'm going to backdate these things and cut down on the firepower and so on and get us back to the methodology of uh, Napoleonic Wars. And I created Strategos M, which was a Napoleonic simplification of the, of the Strategos um, uh, military, professional military game. Um, and we were using it quite a lot. And that was the point at which the group started to break up because there were a number of people in the group who did not really like the idea that there was anybody who would ever be able to tell them they were wrong. Um, and that they absolutely did not like having some guy be a referee who would run the games. So um, that was when we, we split off, and Arneson and I and a large chunk of the group stuck together with the Stigos rules for Napoleonic gaming, and the other guys went off and did their own gaming things um, elsewhere in the cities. Um, now, in, in the middle of all that, at the, at the tail end of that, rather, Arneson is getting started on this Napoleonic campaign that he's going to run. Sergigos has become the tactical rules to use for fighting the battles. And I go off to, I go off to Kansas. Um, so I'd be down in Kansas, pining away from my gaming friends in the Twin Cities and um, inventing new battle scenarios. I was becoming noted for inventing battles, if I was going to referee a battle, I would wind up having this whole complicated backstory and it would be um, um, something sneaky and devious about the way you deploy your forces, that sort of thing. And I would come back from Kansas with a package and we'd get together at my folks house and I would run a battle for everybody and get me, I got into it. Now, I had, I had discovered, as I said, David and a couple of the others, that the seemingly thankless task of being a referee where you didn't get to play um, was um, was not that bad. And uh, uh, you could you had the advantage of this Olympian view of things. You knew what was going on in the battle, and the other people were all following around. There's a lot of hidden movement possibilities with a with a referee. 
And so um, it wasn't all bad to be the referee. You could, you could stand being a referee every, every couple of weeks and missing out on the weekly game as a, as a player because of the compensations that you got for being a referee. So I came back. I came back with the game all with them. Now, we finally arrive on the doorstep of Brownstein. Um, I had been reading books about the theory of, of game design. Um, uh, game theory is a mathematical discipline uh, that was much uh, pumped up during World War II for operations research purposes in which you could dictate optimal strategies for what pattern to use your heavy aircraft to fly in to search for submarines or how to operate convoys and things like that. And I had some books on that at the University of Kansas Library, which I read. And I was also interested in um, sort of broader questions about gaming. And I looked at it and I said, you know, it would be neat to have a game where instead of being either on the red or blue team, whatever nationality countries those refer to for this particular historical period. Um, typically, a war game was being run as a hobby war game would have two sides. You'd be the French and the British or the um, Italians and the Germans or the Germans and the British, whatever. Um, and everybody that was in the game would be on either Team A or Team B. Um, and you had just a simple two-sided thing. But in, in the game's theory, um, there were prospects for having multi-sided games. Now, multi-sided games certainly already existed. Monopoly, for example, let's say everybody's out for himself, right? But there was an, another complicating factor in the real world, which I saw in these, these abstract books I was reading, uh, which is that in a multi, well, you don't always just have a simple head-to-head -head competition in the world. It's normal to have, every, each person has a bunch of objectives you'd like to satisfy, and the reason that you can end anything by negotiation instead of total, total elimination is that in the, in the real world if there's conflict going on, um, as for example between the, the union and the management of the corporation, um, there's a bunch of things that the guys in the union would like, like to get besides just more, more, more money per hour. And there's a long number of things that the corporation could yield on um, other than giving them higher wages. And so you get a negotiator in there, and in the end it develops that. The guys who work in the factory would really, really like to have two weeks off every year instead of just one. Um, and if you're going to give them a two-week vacation, uh, then they're not going to be so sticky about the fact that the pay isn't going to increase uh, over last year's hourly rate. Um, and the corporation can look at it and say, well, if we have a really slow season, every summer or August, is to work just goes drops out next to nothing. So we'll get everybody an extra week in August. That's fine with us. So you can, you can come to a happy accommodation where each side gets something out of it. It's not a zero-sum game. It's, 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 you can both come out ahead. Now, that's an example for you know, labor relations management things that was one of these books I was looking at. I said, we could have a game in which you don't run an army. You don't even run a battalion of an army. You run one individual person who is out there trying to take care of himself and stay alive and maybe walk off of some loot and so on. And um, let's see how, how that could be done. So I imagine this hypothetical city called Brownstein, which is in 1796, and it is between the... Um, French and Prussian forces, um, and uh, you people are all running civilians in this city with who will each have their own individual objective. I mean, the, the banker has a bunch of money in his bank, and if the town is all run by the French, it'll probably all be stolen, and he has to come up with some ways of protecting himself against that. The um, the uh, student, there's a, a radical students in town that support the French who would love to see the French army march in so they can all cheer and, and uh, erect a guillotine and have a revolution. Um, and there are all these other people who have their individual things in their lives and they're pulling in different directions. And in the course of the game, uh, you will try to advance the interests of the character that you are playing um, by forming alliances with the other players 
Um, and some people out there will be helpful to you, and some people out there probably will try to do their best to stop you from getting what you want because it's opposed to what they want. But it isn't obvious who is who in many cases when the game first starts. <laughs> One example is um, our student E, who it's briefly starts out, you are a lucky bastard. That is to say, you don't know who your father is, but the world has been working out pretty good for you lately. And we go through some briefing about how he's successful. And he's, he's, he's a, uh, he is about to become a member of the faculty of Brownstein University. He is just hanging in, 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 at the edge right now. He's a tutor to the banker's daughter. Um, and um, and he was, among his objectives are find out who your father is. Um, and so there, we drop him in with this very non-military set of objectives, right? Well, so... Here I come back. I come back home uh, for for the Christmas holidays, and everybody knows Wesley's going to have a game at his house or at least at my father's house, actually, um, uh, on Saturday after Christmas. And um, which, by the way, is uh, today is the 51st anniversary of. Um, and wow. they all show up at my place, and I have the usual big uh, four sheets of supply, three sheets of plywood uh, put together to make a big table, uh, uh, six by twelve feet with um, lots of scenery and lots of, sorry, lots of model railroad uh, scenery and buildings and stuff set up on it to make this town. And um, over on the side, I have the, all, the, all of my Napoleonic miniatures uh, all laid out like we're going to be using them in the game tonight because that's how everybody's going to greet this thing. And I have a feeling that it's a grand idea I've got that's going to fall flat on its face. And people are going to come to me and say, why the hell aren't we sh shooting anybody yet? And I'll say, oh, well, as a matter of fact, your brigade is coming in right over here right now. And we'll just start pulling out the troops and marching them in. And we'll have a classic Napoleonic battle and the hell with my, with my experimental idea. So I was set up to you know, distract to do that. But the, the troops are all there just as window dressing. They're, they're not there to actually take part in any kind of fighting or anything. Um, and so... I got them together, and I had ideas about how I was going to run the game, and I had these carefully detailed briefings for eight characters in the game, and the players were going to be playing these eight characters. However, 22 people show up, so if player number nine shows up, I have to quick invent a new character for him and a new set of objectives for him and put him into the game. And as you can imagine, it would be inventing him as a running the game, um, things are getting completely out of hand. So I had really lost track of who number 17 was and what he was supposed to be doing. Um, in the midst of all this, I had a plan as to how I was going to run the game. The guys were all going to be out in the main part of the basement around the table looking at all the scenery, scenery again, looking at all the scenery. And I was going to be at the pool table in the next room over where people would come into me, I'd have a map, I'd have pins stuck in the map to show where everybody was. They'd, I'd summon somebody and I'd say, all right, you're here, what are you going to do next? Where do you want to move to? Who do you want to talk to? I'd get all the information from him and send him out and tell him to send back in so-and-so else. And I would keep track of what everybody's doing to have him rotate past my secret command post in the back room. Um, this was a really bad idea. <laughs> Because with, with eight people, I now know I could not have run it that way effectively. Uh, with 22, there's no way. I mean, you'd get a chance to see me at, if it took only two minutes per person, you'd get a chance to see me once every 44 minutes. This doesn't work. Um, two of the guys came walking into me. Jim Clark and Dave Arneson came walking in to talk to me uh, without having been summoned. And... They came in and they said, hi, we're going to fight a duel. How do we do it? And I said, but, but uh, you guys aren't anywhere near each other. I mean, he's over here at the college, here in town here. No, he said, no, he came over across the river a long time ago. <laughs> oh, he did. I said, realizing that people are doing stuff without checking with me. Um, and so then we explained it a little further. And so I see, they said, yeah, and, and I'm going to, he, he's, he's insulted me and I'm gonna, we're going to have a duel. And I had to, this, this is a, a situation I hadn't quite planned on, <laughs> but I just made it up on the spot. Um, I said, all right, you get to roll 
3D6 and you get to roll 2D6. And the 2D6 would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm the captain of the fencing team. Why do I only get two dice and he gets three? And I said, because he's a professional military officer who has fought in dozens of duels to the death in his career, and you have been prancing around in the gymnasium with a sort of a little button on the end so you don't hurt anybody. Oh, comes the realization. Uh, and so they rolled the dice. Now, it's not impossible under the circumstances. The guy with two dice could you know, roll, take it all 12, and the guy with three dice could roll a three. But that's not how it turned out. It was, uh, the score was rather, was uh, 2 to 17. <laughs> and um, Dave Arneson was around right through the heart. <laughs> and so Arneson became the first person to ever die in a role playing game. That's awesome. Um, but that had alerted me to the fact that stuff was going on I wasn't party to. So I walked from out of the back room, I went out in the main room, and there's people gathered together in corners, wheeling and dealing and haggling and just going. Game without bothering to tell me what they're doing. Uh, and so by the end of the evening, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I've been at it for 12 hours. Oh, and I'm just drained. I'm exhausted. I called them all back into my little uh, bunker there. And um, I said, Guys, I'm sorry. I'm just exhausted. I, I'm going to have to knock them off. Um, I just got down completely in hand. I can't begin to tell you who won this game. And, and my scoring system had completely broken down. It depended on me knowing every move everybody made and scoring him as he went along, and it was just never happened. So I said, uh, we're, um, we're just going to have to uh, call it off now. I'm sorry to waste your evening. And they all said, no, we love it. We love it. It was great fun. It was great fun. I thought, oh, they're being so kind to me. And That's then they DM. went their way, so, and oh, I went back to, back to Kansas at the end of vacation. Um, and a few months, or oh, a few weeks later, in fact, it was uh, uh, midwinter break time. Um, they had camera had a, the University of Kansas had a kind of a stupid schedule where you would have all your final exams for the fall semester after Christmas, and then you would have a winter break. So um, it was it was an odd way to do it. You wanted the two vacations of a couple of weeks apart. In any case, I came back home again, and I said, so when are you getting another Brownstein game? And I said, it was, it was a disaster. He said, no, no, everybody loved it. Well, gee, I guess, okay, we will. So I decided I'll, I'll run another one while well, I was back for Easter. And between then and Easter, I sat back in my room in Kansas saying, what did I, you know, okay, this time it's not going to get out of hand. I'm going to put a real control on this one. So I came up with Bronstein 2. I'd been reading a book called Kudita, a Practical Handbook. A uh, neat book, by the way. You should, you should all read it. Um, which tells you how to overthrow a government in, in, in any of the ways in the world where you have dictatorships. Um, and I decided the next time I'd want to want to set up Latin America, we're going to have a banana republic. We're going to have this chaotic situation where all the people are pulling in different directions. So, but this time I'm not going to let it get out of hand. There's going to just be like four people in the game so I can watch them all, all the time and we're going to sit around the table so everything everybody does is visible to me. And they won't get to do nothing without getting cleared by me first. Well, that was a disaster. Um, that just, just, I was happy that only four people were invited to come play this game because only four people got to see what a stinker it was. Um, before I went home at the end of Easter vacation, and I proceeded to uh, uh, to try to tweak the rules a little bit to make it work better. Total disaster again. So Brownstein's two and three are this Latin American scenario thing that was complete failure. Um, and then I went back to college until the next next uh, summer, um, saying to myself, "What did I do right the first time and do wrong the second time?" And I concluded that I, I came up with two critical ideas that were important to it. Um, the one was in uh, uh, that there's this great British motto: um, "It isn't whether you win or lose; it's how you play the game." Now that's supposed to be about good sportsmanship, but in my case, what it was was it really is how you play the game, and not whether you win or lose. You played Dungeons and Dragons millions of times by now, and you get some people and you say, "Okay, what's what was your what was your coolest thing you've done lately?" Right? Oh, they'll 
tell you something like this. We went our way through the woods of doom and gloom until we found the tower of eternal damnation. Um, <coughs> and we gathered at the base, and there was only bodies laying around it. Um, and um, we wanted to climb up the side because there's no doors or windows on this thing, so way up at the very top, there's this barred window. Uh, we wanted to climb the sides, but it's all covered with glass, so it's slippery and you can't climb it. So, we had our magic user levitate my thief all the way up 70 feet up to this window on the top of the tower so I could pick the lock and we could get in. As soon as I got the lock picked, this black dragon stuck his head out the door and fried me to a crisp. And then he came down around the tower and killed everybody else in the party. It's called Tuesday at Dick's house. And, uh, <laughs> Really, you say to him, oh, so throw the party kill. And he says, yeah, but it was felt cool because uh, Jack's barbarian got in this really good lick at him and broke one of his wings. He couldn't fly anymore. But in the end, <laughs> you go through the whole, you know, now you get, you know, 15, 15 minutes of blow by blow description of the battle. And they all had a wonderful time, even though they all died. Um, and for nine out of 10 gamers, that's it. It's your things you do, the cool stuff you pull off in the middle of the game, and not whether you came out ahead or behind on points. There are about 10% of them, you have gamers who absolutely insist that they've got to get more gold pieces than everybody else or more experience points or whatever. They've got to have these tokens of victory. But most people don't. They just want to participate in it. They don't care if it, how it turns out in the end so much. And that was one principle. The other one that I came up with, which meant for me that I did not have to have an intricate scoring system that would be absolutely fair and even. I would instead have have a an open-ended system where I could work out who won, but I didn't have to be able to hair split between them. Secondly, um, I had said something about Chico's hand rules years ago, which was very important to how to play the game, and that was that um, players can attempt anything, but not always successfully. Um, if anything comes up and they want to try something, they can tell you, well, I'm going to do such and such, and as the referee who's running the game, you say, well, um, gee, that looks like that'd be really hard to do, and, he, and then we have some discussion, for example. Party and tell a flame pit. Um, your barbarian hero says, I'm going to jump across the flame pit. And you say, wait a minute, that, that's a really wide flame pit you're going to jump across there. Are you sure about that? And he says, okay, I'm going to take off all of my armor and just strip down to my loincloth and I'm going to hold my dagger in my teeth. And now I'm going to have a long run at it and jump across. And because he's come up with some sort of reason why he should do a little better than total, uh, absolute guaranteed failure, you say, okay, roll 3d6, and if you score um, 16 and above, uh, you successfully cross the pit. You've just given him a really poor chance of making it, but is he going to chance? And he still hasn't elected to make a run for it. He could still say at this point, uh, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. But he says, yes, of course, I'll go for it. So Frog, the barbarian, madly runs down the hall, lunges out across, and now we roll the dice. Now, how do you play it from there? Well, if you come up with, say, 11, up too bad, Throck doesn't make the other side, he can burn to a crisp. It's his own fault for having made that stupid choice. It's the fault of the dice for just being out to get him, but it's not the fault of the referee. Um, on the other hand, if he rolls 17, 16, 17, 18, he makes it miraculous, fantastic leap you've done there, boy, congratulations. Right? Now you're on the other side, and the, uh, the guys on the other side kind of throw a rope across to you or something, get everybody else across. And, of course, if he rolls a 15, you, can, you, can, you will then proceed to run it as follows. Wow, Throg just gets his fingers hooked on the far edge of the flame pit. And the flames are licking at his feet. What are you going to do now? And if Thrag is smart, he says, I spit out the dagger. <laughs> and he makes it as a miraculous feat, you see. So um, with that kind of an approach to things, things get much, much livelier and a lot more fun. And um, so we came back, and I set up this brown sign four, which is in the banania. Um, in Latin America, and we had all these characters. We again 
player characters, individuals, each have their own meta, their own goals and so on. And it ran really well. And when we got to the end of the game, um, uh, I had the scoring system I had in mind. I, I, I ran it, something I could run at the end of the game, not continuously throughout the game. I ran it and we worked out that because the head of the secret police and the head of the army <laughs> were ahead, agreed that they would indeed stick together and it privately told me, each of them told me that he would honor his commitments to the other one and not stab him in the back, um, that between them they had enough strength points in various ways to guarantee that they could create a stable government for the country and go on to be in a new dictatorship. Um, the alternative was if nobody came up high enough, congratulations, you have a civil war, keep fighting. Uh, <laughs> but when I got done with it, I then proceeded to tell them the amazing things that Arneson had been doing in terms of role playing throughout that game. And everyone was just awestruck and they said, Yeah, I don't care what the scoring system said, he won. No. Now, uh, they, they, I got to give you a of answer for your question, simple little question. <laughs> no, that's great. No, thank you. Um, it's just amazing how it, you know, the game we play is basically you, is what you described, what, 50-something years ago. That's, that's truly amazing. You know, and, and the fact that you did have kind of stepped fails where it's not just, you know, a lot of times it's save or die. You could, you, you already put the thing of, well, you maybe got poisoned, but you're not completely dead. Uh, that, that, you know, all the modern games that we play today even have all those features that you guys just made up. Totally incredible. Um, so is, do we have anything from the chat? Any, any, any questions? So if you have questions for Dave Wesley, please uh, put them in the chat and we'll be happy to talk or else Dan has his extensive timeline. This is your life, the Dave Wesley edition. He's, he's got uh, for you. Yeah, and I don't want to. I don't want to monopolize the question. So if anyone here has uh, Vic, if you have any questions, just no. Just I'm gonna. Say. I'm trying to set up another game with David. Probably end of February. We're gonna probably do Bronstein Four with the wow. Twin Cities Gaming Group, and I just gotta get with David and make sure all the dates are correct. And Fantasy Flight Games is where we usually play, so we can I'll get all that together. And, and we'll put your link. To, that'll be on yeah. Facebook, right? right? So if you're uh, flying around in February in the Twin Cities area. That would be amazing to get there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And Dave, I would, do you credit Dave Arneson with the idea of creating your own player character? Because I know when you did Bronstein, they were basically you know, what we would now call pre-generated characters. You gave them motives. And my understanding is from your Bronstein 4 game uh, that, you know, that uh, Arneson decided, I want to be this guy who you know, pretends he's part of the CIA and all that. Do, do, do you credit him with coming up with the idea of creating your own character? In, in many ways, um, if you were, I had all these, as you would call them now, pre-gen characters um, that were going to be driving the uh, activities. But um, in many cases, the, my intention was, and my briefing with the players was, that you could kind of run it any way you wanted to. I mean. You can be, if you're, just because you're the, the general of the Air Force, it uh, doesn't mean that you're limited to telling your airplanes where to fly, or your parrot, more more to the point, your paratroopers what buildings to seize. You, um, you have a lot of interaction with the other players, and um, if you uh, run down and capture the radio station, you can start imagining and making up mythological um, uh, press releases from the radio station to the public, and things like that, that if no actual you know, was not pre pre planned, right? But Arneson, who was given one of the least interesting of the characters to play, of the region characters, who was this pacifist who's uh, handing out the putting leaflets around town to try to overthrow the uh, regime by uh, by moral pressure, which is going to get him nothing but a bullet, you understand. Um, and he came up with this whole idea because I briefed the guys the game off the room started to brief the guys individually over the week before we played the game. And so I already briefed them on who he was and where he works and what his, what his official rules for how he's going to score points were. And then he came back to me and he had 14 pieces of forged identification that he had created. He said, could I use them in the game? And I looked at them and I said to myself, Oh, this is going to totally destroy the play balance in this thing. That's just, I, I can't let him do this. And then I smacked myself a dope, dope slap and I said, 
player should be allowed to try anything, not always successfully. Um, so, sure, did. go ahead, I said, and we'll see where that goes. And it turned out, of course, to inject all sorts of activity in the game. Nowadays, put into a, a, a Brownstein 4 game, everybody who's already played role-playing games a bazillion times um, immediately have things that will come to their mind about, well, I'm going to go down to the fishing wharves, and I'm going to see if I can buy a fishing boat from one of these peasants along here, because that way I can get out of town alive. <laughs> or whatever, you know. Um, and, uh, which people which were not called out part of the rules, but that was, that all went back to um, my ideas, and you know, for that matter, Totten's ideas and Stratego's, that the referee is there to fill in all the gaps in the rules. Hmm. Anything that hasn't been provided for, you can come up to him and say, I want to try to build a bridge across this creek. And the referee then has to turn the crank in his brain and come up with how many hours and how many men it will take the bridge built and that sort of thing. Um, you don't have to have a bridge building rule in your 340 pages of rules uh, to, uh, to cover that. No, I'm I'm wandered off again. So, but I assume I assume that his successful move didn't exactly invent the make your own character, but he got really close to it. Okay. Um, I was much more enthusiastic, much more um, uh, embellished. I just sort of hoped people would do things like that. I hadn't called out that you want to. Um, but once Arneson did it, and everybody else followed that pattern for subsequent brown side games. Great. Okay, and we have some questions, I believe, right, from the uh, chat room? Menion asks, I'm not sure if you asked this, but when did experience points first make an appearance? Ah, yes, yeah, so the question from the chat room, uh, Menion, one of our uh, listeners, asked... And patron. And patron, uh, asks, uh, do you know when uh, experience points, right, and, and level advancement first made, or experience. experience points, first made an appearance? I can't give you a specific date on that um, because I went off to the Army. Um, uh, there was this war out at the time, you may remember. I was, in October of 1970, um, uh, I had to uh, go off and report for active duty. And so then for three years, I was only home on leave a couple of times. When I left, Arneson said to me relative to Brownstein, is it okay if I keep running these games when you're not here? And I said, David, it's set up in your father's basement. Of course you can. Um, we had already worked out that only a modest number of people could run a game competently. Uh, basically, we hadn't yet invented the term Dungeon Master, but the referee, who is the guy who runs all this stuff, requires a certain amount of mental agility and honesty and, and dealing with the players and such. And um, not all of the gamers were up being, to, to fulfilling what we now call a Dungeon Master role. So Arneson and I and two of the other guys were doing the game running in alternation so we could be players on the other weekends. Um, now, as for when did experience points come up, that was one of those things that arrived while I was gone off in the Army. The three-year hole in which this happens, I know what happened before I got back because I came back on leave once and it was in operation. But I can't tell you exactly when, except that it was fairly late on. Um, up to that point, when Arneson, the first, the first Blackmore games that I got to, Arneson um, was basically making the characters were you. And so I was an army officer, and I was in pretty good physical shape, and so I got to be a, a, a serious uh, muscle-bulging barbarian type, um, whereas, um, I say barbarian, but it was not an actual class. It was just, you were a character, you did things. Uh, well, some of the other guys wanted to get into magic, and so Arneson invented rules for how they would do magic. When it came down to um, progressing to the higher levels of experience, that was an idea that was adopted from Michael Carr's um, uh, Fight in the Skies. There's World War I airplane game mm. in which you would have a pilot and he would go out and if he won a victory, he came back. After so many victories, he got to improve his abilities by one step. He would be able to be 
the um, have an additional maneuver card, or you would get uh, a better die roll for scoring hits on the enemy, or whatever. And so you you bump these guys up, but they get increasing experience and built up in their 20, 20 successful missions. You got to be pretty formidable. Um, uh, and Mike's exact rules for that, you can find him if you get yourself a copy of the Fight in the Sky, so it's all work. But that was an outgrowth of one of the things that would work out in the in the 1970-73 time frame, partway through 70 to 73, I'm home on leave, and Arneson has um, worked up the fact that um, your players, can they say, okay, players could take hits, but usually players didn't buy. In fact, it got to a deus ex machine would step in and save your butt, and your character would never die. Because I wasn't afraid he killed off people's characters. He was killing off that very much that person, and uh, you couldn't. Uh, people wouldn't want that. And <laughs> I said, David, it is becoming incredibly dull if you have absolutely no chance of getting out dying. This just just does not work. You've got to make it possible for us to die. So we then moved into the idea that you would have characters that you're running like puppets, not that that guy down there is you. That is your the flock out of the barbarian or runner that you are running. And if he gets killed, well, then you'll damn full of the barbarian will come in next week um, and you'll start a new character. Or you'll leave him come in with a completely different kind of a guy. And that worked out to have all kinds of advantages. And it was roughly patterned on the way that Mike Carr was doing his airplane, his, his uh, World War One pilots. Excellent. Um, so I can't tell you exactly when it occurred, but it did occur probably in 72 before I got back, before I came back permanently. Okay. What's the, other, do we have other questions? Yeah. We have other questions here. Uh, okay. Cyber has to ask a question for David. Do you play a lot of RPGs still? And if so, which game is your favorite? So do you play a lot of RPGs still? And if so, which is your favorite? Question from uh, long-time Cyber listener Heston. Cyber Heston. Also a patron. Also no, patron. I, I do not play a lot of RPGs. I mean, I run Brownstein repeats Brownside 1 and Brownside 4 games, and one of these days I will dust off Brownside 5 and bring it out for everybody, too. Um, we have, uh, as far as the role-playing games go, the only thing that I get involved in uh, for the last several years has been the annual Blackmore game um, that's been run uh, for uh, on Artisan's, Artisan's birthday. Um, and uh, as part of the ongoing Blackmore campaign that has been kept alive by Bob Meyer, um, since David died. Nice. Uh, David was doing this at least once a year. We all get together and do another step forward in his Blackmore campaign. And after David died, Bob decided he was going to keep it going, so he's been doing it. So I get involved in that. But other than that, I do not see a lot of uh, role-playing games. I'm, I'm mostly an historical gamer. <laughs> and so we do naval battles and, and uh, uh, the Napoleonic Air naval battles and, uh, and the World War II naval battles and American Civil War uh, land battles and uh, that sort of stuff uh, in my gaming here in the Twin Cities. Okay. Uh, any uh, any questions from the chat? Yep. More questions uh, from the chat room. Thompson asked, "Did you, uh, the group, in parentheses, make the rules on creating an, in, an individual character?" So the question is, did uh, you guys, the group, uh, make the rules for creating individual characters? And I assume the Blackmore group. off of the I can't ever kill anybody uh, position and into, oh yeah, you can die and you'll have to start a new character. Uh, shortly thereafter, we were involved in, um, uh, yep, okay, well, sit down, here's some dice, roll some dice and create the characteristics, um, wisdom, intelligence, strength, uh, dexterity, and so on uh, for your character. And um, game forward with this poor level one guy that you just created. Um, and, but a lot of that evolution was going on when I was only coming home on, you know, every several months I'd get the little leave and I'd come home for Christmas or something. Um, so I just got these snapshots of it happening as we went past. Um, but it was, uh, it was underway. And by the time I got back in 73, um, David had already taken the game down, taken Blackmore down and showed it to Gary. And Gary had created Greyhawk, and 
David and Gary were corresponding with each other about rules, ideas, and things. So the, 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 the you know who who made what contribution to where in that period is a little harder for me to say because I was you know I was out, out, out of the loop and I would just show up and something would be happening and oh this is for the later last night and that would be it. Um, other guys that were in the group all the time uh, who, who talked to me, of course, well, what's been going on while you were gone, uh, gave me some second-hand knowledge on things, but that's not quite the same as first-hand testimony. Did, do you know, out of curiosity, do you know, did you speak with Dave Arneson about his thoughts on original D&D when it was published in 1974? Because I know that Dave Arneson later publishes his own role-playing game, which my understanding is he wanted that to be more in line with his vision of what the game would be like originally. So, you know, I, I, I didn't know if, if you were aware of whether or not he, you know, was, was, you know, what his view was on that original product that came out. Well, I came back in the fall of 73, and uh, at that point, David and Gary are in the process of, of sending thick envelopes full of stuff back and forth between them, because of course we don't have the internet in those days, um, and we're 400 miles apart, so you don't just you know hop in a car and drive over there. Uh, so they are exchanging manuscript copies and marking them up and sending them back. And so I got a certain amount of exposure. I'm going back and telling and hanging out with David a lot. A certain amount of exposure to David's um, uh, red penciling of the latest set of proposed rules for uh, from Gary. Uh, and uh, what does he think he's doing? He would say things like that, right? Like, um, so there was more dispute between them. But ultimately, the bottom line of it was that Dungeons and Dragons uh, was getting hammered out between them. Um, Arneson could not type, uh, and Arneson's uh, spelling and grammar left much to be desired, too. Um, but he was running his end of it then through uh, the wife of one of our friends, Gail Gaylord, who's still alive, who was actually typing everything up for David and um, uh, has, uh, you know, has many things to say about that because she was right there. Right? She, she's doing the typing. Obviously, she gets to see the manuscripts, right? Um, and there was this healthy exchange between David and Gary about how to do things. And... Um, to hear, hear, hear Arneson's bitching and bellyaching to me, it was all like, that guy never had an idea that could possibly ever be wrong. Gary just comes up with these screwball ideas that are never going to work, and he keeps shoving them into these rules, yada, 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 right now. Of course, that's, you know, not intended here syndrome, too, of course. Um, uh, he always found it the way he planned on doing things, the way that somebody else planned on doing things. So there's sort of a, a certain measure of... Uh, of uh, Oh, I suppose Gilbert and Sullivan argued with each other about the, the stuff that they were writing in collaboration, too, right? Um, so I don't think we should attach too much uh, emphasis to the notion that somehow Gary screwed it all up. That, that's ridiculous. Um, he, Arneson, had the feeling that there were too many of his ideas that Gary had, had, had dropped from the rules and substituted his own dumb ways of doing things. This was a... a constant complaint, and it would be the case of anybody who would collaborate with anybody, I think. Um, in the end, after the, after the split up, there was an extended period in which there's this lawsuit underway, and in which each of them would have a lawyer saying to them, um, don't ever concede anything. If we're going to give anything away, let me do it. You just shut up. Anybody asks you, you say you did it all by yourself, and the other guy had nothing to do with it. That's our starting position. And so Gary is making pronouncements of that sort um, through the pages of the Dragon Magazine, um, which gives him an enormous pulpit, which has resulted in tens of thousands of people who read it when they were 12 years old, and the sacred words dripping from Gary's pen, um, and they, have never, they will never get over the impression they got in those days about how one-sided it all was he carried it all by himself. At the same time, Arneson is being told by his lawyers never admit anything to anybody about any but Gary having done any of the work, this claim was all yours, and then when we negotiate this matter, we'll come up to some setting in between, but we'll leave it to the lawyers to negotiate. And that went on for years, and that 
produced some real hardening of positions and things, which is very unfortunate. Um, after they finally got settlements on it, and Arneson is, uh, now has a bunch of money, so he can start his own publishing company, he then proceeded to come up with Adventures in Fantasy, which was going to be his chance to show the world of how, how it should have been done. Um, so that is, if you want to compare what it says in Adventures in Fantasy with the way that, that OD&D is written, that's probably a good, a good source for you. So, um, yeah, that's... So Arneson go ahead. was uh, in, a, in a strange position there, and what made it stranger was that um, uh, come on, David. Get me, get my, get my characters right here. Um, We're just running out of time. Oh. All right, Lawrence oh. Schick. There we are. Um, Lawrence Schick set out to write a book about how uh, role playing games got started, and he came to Arneson in the middle of this period when the lawsuits going on. He goes to Arneson and he says, uh, "Where'd you come up with the idea for the role playing stuff?" And at that point, Arneson's lawyer would have said, absolutely, I did it myself on Monday morning. I was looking in the mirror and I said, I'm going to invent role-playing games or whatever, right? And instead, Arneson says to Lawrence Schick, oh, I got it all from Dave, Ar Dave Wesley. To which Lawrence says, who the hell is Dave Wesley? Um, but Lawrence's book that came out way back um, it has, in, at one point in it, it mentions that Arneson credits me with having invented role-playing games. No, I invented it, but it also is a question of, it's one thing to invent it, and it's another thing to um, make it successful. We're, we're going to we're gonna, um, we're gonna end it. I love historical an analogies. Uh, there is, a, most people have never heard of Octave Chanute. Um, unless you live on the right part of Illinois where this Chanute field is located, uh, you've never heard of this guy. But he was in a maker of gliders back in the 1890s. Um, he was a part of a, of a general push to try to fly, and he built these really nice gliders, and he would get up on high hills, run down the side, and jump off and glide off across the valley with them. Um, and so to some degree, though, that the aerodynamics aren't the same as a, a modern hang glider. It was the same sort of performance, however, you could get... You could get quite a good long distance on a glide on this thing, and you could fly for mm, several minutes. Um, his gliders <coughs> are these big boxy things. And then along come the Wright brothers, and they build their first successful airplane. And it looks just like one of his gliders, only they've put an engine on it. And Octave Chinook, for those people who are, you know, the, 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 very, the very small...